When it comes to Christmas trees, I've got to admit I am old school, and here's what I mean by that. I think that the perfect Christmas tree is one that was cut down from a forest, or better yet, dug up from a forest, and placed in somebody's living room. Now, I came on this honestly. In fact, when I was growing up, my dad used to take us out to my papa's dairy farm where we would leave our home in the city and we would go back to the country in Kentucky and we would find during that afternoon or late into the evening as my dad would walk around to find the perfect Christmas tree. Now myself and my little brother, we knew that resistance to this was was just worthless. We could not resist. Dad had to find the perfect tree, sometimes even into the night. And as he took out his dull axe and cut down the tree or dug it up, our job, my brother and I's job, was to drag the tree back through the forest and place it on top of our wood-paneled station wagon where we drove it back to the city. Now, here's why I like this. Because we had in the city the best, the most perfect Christmas tree of any of our neighbors. In fact, our Christmas tree had real live squirrels in it. Our... Our Christmas tree had an old deer stand in it. We had the best, most perfect Christmas tree of anybody in the paved part of Kentucky. And so uh, when I got married, Becky and I uh, began to talk about what our uh, plans were for our Christmas tree. And I informed her that we needed to buy a wood panel station wagon, go out to my papa's farm, (laughs) chop down a tree, or better yet, dig it up, drag it in, and put it into our living room. And she then informed me that the perfect Christmas tree is one that is purchased at Target. That is her idea of the perfect Christmas tree. She said, if I wanted to go out and chop down a tree or dig one up, I could go by myself. So, guess what kind of tree I have in my home in Cape Coral? An artificial tree, exactly, exactly. I lost that debate. Well, it seems to me these days, especially the last few days, that people are on on a quest for not only the perfect Christmas tree, but for the perfect Christmas. I mean, people are going around trying to find the perfect present at the perfect price. Um, People are out searching for an opportunity and dreaming of the day that they will get together and have the perfect meal with the perfect set of family and the perfect set of friends. Well, they will have a perfect evening where everyone gets along just perfectly. That's what people are after these days. Now, can I tell you my experience with this? is I don't have any experience with this. I, 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 I know that there are people that have the perfect Christmas, uh, but I'm not one of them. I see you all on, on Facebook. I, I see those people that have the perfect Christmas. I, I see those people that can go and shop and find all those things and seemingly, for a little while at least, be, be happy. But that's not been uh, my experience. In fact, uh, whenever I've tried to have the perfect Christmas, I want to tell you, it's not for lack of effort. It's not for lack of effort. I've really tried hard to have the perfect Christmas But uh, can I tell you what's happened to me as I've tried to have the perfect Christmas? Uh, I'll be trying really hard, and then somebody I love dies. I'll be trying really hard, and somebody that I love starts drinking again. I'll be trying really hard, and somebody that I love falls into a pit of despair, and I'm helpless to be able to fix it. What's worse is... Sometimes the problem is not out there with other people. The problem's in here with me. I get broken down on that road to the perfect Christmas. My own depression gets in the way and I start to feel lonely. My own lack of financial wise stewardship and management of my finances leads me to not be able to afford what I want to give to other people or even to the church. And so you can maybe, if you struggle with this, Uh, Maybe you and I can be friends, okay? (laughs) Anybody else here, have have you broken down on the road to the perfect Christmas? (laughs) I have. I really want to have one. (laughs) I want to have that that perfect Christmas. And what I love about the Gospels is that God invites us to end our exhaustive search. God invites us to not even have to settle for cheap, artificial imitations for the perfect Christmas. God wants to give us today rest. And here's what might be helpful to us as we begin our journey towards healing and rest this Advent season, is to recognize that our definition of perfect and the Bible's definition of perfect are completely different. In our world, I looked up this week what the dictionary says uh, is the meaning of perfect, and it is having all of the desirable conditions. 
You know, where everything just lines up perfectly, where all the circumstances fall in the line. You got enough money, energy, time, everybody's getting along, and we want to have that if just for a moment. Can't we all just get along, right? And we have those uh, desires to have everything line up perfectly. Can I tell you, the Bible has a different definition of perfect. In the New Testament, I found this week that the word perfect is the word teleos, which means, get this, completeness, wholeness, lacking nothing, and mature. In fact, when the Bible talks about and uses the word perfect, like in one of my favorite passages in, the gospel, in, in John, one of the letters that one of the disciples writes, he says, perfect love drives out all fear. Perfect love, meaning completeness, wholeness, lacking nothing, mature in faith. That kind of uh, completeness, that kind of perfection is something that the Bible talks about. I like it already, don't you? Because this kind of uh, perfect Christmas is not dependent upon anything or anybody. It's only dependent upon our relationship with Jesus, that we might grow up in him, that we might be mature and complete and lacking nothing because our soul is at rest, not in our circumstances, but in Christ. That's a different kind of Christmas, and it's one that I'm longing for. In fact, I think it'd be the the perfect Christmas. The Bible tells us that Jesus came and he meets us in the midst of our imperfections. That's good news, isn't it? Any imperfect people in the house today? I think this is good news. Jesus even goes out and he finds people who are imperfect. He actually wants to help us and he wants to be with us. This is why I love the Gospels. It's like what Phil Rickham wrote, the songwriter. He said, Jesus brings our chaos back into order. He makes the orphan a son and daughter. This is amazing grace. This is unfailing grace. Love, no set of circumstances, no matter how perfect or pleasurable or desirable or popular in the world's eyes, will be able to fill the hole in our soul as only Jesus Christ can. Can somebody say amen? Amen. Friends, we're going to take on some of these barriers that leave us broken down on the road to the perfect Christmas in this series. I hope you'll be here for every part of it. I hope you've brought a friend. Thank you, those of you that did. And guess what? We're going to take on uh, one of the ones that seems to be uh, so prevalent in our society. One of the barriers is the barrier of busyness. Busyness. Has anybody been busy lately? Have you seen how busy everybody is? In fact, this busyness that we have during this time of the year is reinforced by the songs that are playing on the radio. Christmas songs. I found one this week that I wanted to share with you. It's called, I Need a Perfect Christmas. Look with me at the lyrics to this song. It goes like this. Holl out the holly, put up the tree before my spirit falls again. Fill up the stockings. I may be rushing things, but deck the halls again now. For we need a little Christmas right this very minute. Candles in the window. Carols in the spinet. Look at the next part. Yes, we need a little Christmas right this very minute. As it's not a single flurry, but Santa dear, we're in a hurry. For I've grown a little leaner. I've grown a little colder. I've grown a little sadder. And I've grown a little older. And we need a little angel sitting on my shoulder. I need a little Christmas now. Right? When do we want our Christmas? We want it now. now. That's right. Isn't that sad? Look at the lyrics of this song. <laughs> this song is freaking me out this week. I heard this song and I had to get a bag and I was breathing in the bag. (gasps) Right, right. It's freaking me out. It's no wonder we're so busy because this is the music that's playing on our radios. (laughs) I need a little Christmas and I need it. Now, if you've heard the song, it it freaks you out. Don't listen to it if you haven't. We're going to talk about... um, We're going to talk about this stress that we feel today. Now, listen. (laughs) I'm not naive enough to think that we can somehow slow down the entire world with what we're talking about in the next few minutes. Um, it's, you know, the, the world is just going around. It's, it's in chaos. It's, it's moving really fast. But guess what? I believe that through the power of the Holy Spirit, present here in this very moment, that God can do something within us. That God could still our soul so that as the Christmas carol sings, our soul might feel it's worth. Ah, I want that, don't you? Of all the things that I want for Christmas, that is the thing that would mean the most. And today we're going to learn from a person in the Bible who's discovered this, somebody we can all learn from. He had the perfect Christmas, the way the Bible understands perfect. In the midst of the chaos around him, a man by the name of Simeon can help us begin 
to answer this question this morning. In the midst of busyness, how can I have the perfect Christmas? In the midst of busyness. All right, so look with me at number one. Here we go. I can have the perfect Christmas by having a clear priority. Everybody say priority. Priority, right? We just sang a song about uh, placing God first, and that's what Simeon does in his life. Let me set the story up for you. Uh, it's been just about six weeks in the Gospel of Luke since uh, Mary and Joseph had welcomed Jesus into this world as a baby. The shepherds have come, and they've sung hymns, and they've gone out and begun to spread the news. And at this time, Mary and Joseph make their way from Bethlehem to the temple in Jerusalem for their purification as well as to present Jesus there in that place. Now, the temple was a massive complex. Picture in your mind's eye thousands of people milling around. The western wall alone is four and a half football fields long. So can you picture that in your mind? Now picture Mary and Joseph making their way, holding baby Jesus. I mean, new parents are filled with excitement and exhaustion. And they're no different. They're making their way to the temple. And that's when they meet this old man by the name of Simeon. As we're going to see, he's been waiting for them and waiting for this moment for a long, long time. And he has a clear priority. Look with me as how Luke introduces him to us in Luke 225. Let's read it out loud together. Ready? Go. At that time, there was a man in Jerusalem named Simeon. He was righteous and devout and was eagerly waiting for the Messiah to come rescue Israel. So, let's take a look, take a look at this verse. You might want to uh, circle a couple of words. First, Luke introduces us to us. He's a man living in Jerusalem, but look what makes him special. He is righteous, and he's devout. Circle those two words. Now, look at the sentence with me in Luke's description. What is Simeon devout about? What is his priority? What is his focus? He was eagerly waiting, read it with me, for the Messiah to come and rescue Israel. This is Simeon's one single purpose. He's got one priority in his life, and that is to see Jesus Christ. And don't think that this was some easy time back then, like without any distractions going on. I sometimes think that when I read the Bible, like it was just a Hallmark card. Everything was just perfect. They don't understand the pressures we feel today, right? Well, guess what was going on in Simeon's lifetime? It had been 400 years since God had given an update to humanity on his plan of salvation. The rule-keeping, joy-killing Pharisees were coming to dominate religion in that day. What about politics? Was that all uh, nice? No. King Herod was now in office. The same Herod who had killed his own father-in-law, his wife, and a couple of his own sons. The same Herod whose war on Christmas included an assassination attempt on Jesus when he was just a baby, resulting in the death of every baby boy in Bethlehem at those days. This is a tough time Simeon was living in. He'd lived through the Roman invasion of Jerusalem and Pompey's massacre of the priest. And yet with all of this going on, Simeon had one goal, and it was well with his soul. What was his goal? He was waiting, and not just waiting. What kind of waiting? Eagerly waiting. He's excited. He's got a focus in his life, and with all that's going on around him, it didn't mess with him. He had placed his hope in the promise that God had revealed to him, and so his soul stands on tiptoes as he's waiting for the Messiah to come. This is why we can learn uh, from Simeon, because no matter the circumstances going on around him, even God's silence, Simeon held on because he had this priority. He had joy in waiting for Jesus coming. That was his goal. That was his priority. I've got a question for us today. What is your priority this Christmas? What is mine? I've been asking that of myself in these recent days. Can I suggest something extremely countercultural to us and for us today? What if our only goal was like Simeon to see the Messiah, to experience Jesus' salvation and the rescue that he wants to bring, to place Jesus as Lord and leader of our life? Wouldn't that make for a perfect Christmas in your life? If we just had one goal, 
of everything else, that we would have one goal in everything else, that Jesus would be our priority, that we would have him as a Messiah, that we could join with the saints of old, we could join with the Apostle Paul, who said, I want to know Christ and the power of his resurrection, even if it means sharing in the joy of sharing in his sufferings, so that I might experience the resurrection from the dead. I want to know Christ. That could be a Christmas prayer, don't you think? I want to know Christ. So this week, what if things get hectic? What if things get busy? What if things get stressful? What if things go wrong? Could you join me in making a prayer go like this? I want to know Christ. (laughs) Well, I want to know Christ. I want to know Christ. That's our focus. That's what Simeon teaches us, that we can have this one priority, that of the Messiah. That would be a perfect Christmas. Look at number two. I can have the perfect Christmas in the midst of busyness by practicing the discipline of listening. Now, I know we're not very good at listening, at least I'm not. This is why we like to have background music in elevators. Have you ever ridden in an elevator without background music with a bunch of strangers? I did it recently. It is so nerve-wracking, right? (laughs) Just that silence. It's the longest 90 seconds of my life when I have to stand in an elevator with strangers with no background music. Have you ever seen what happens in my doctor's office? They have giant TVs that are blaring in the waiting room. So while I'm waiting to go get my blood pressure checked, I'm learning about ISIS and terrorist attacks, and I'm learning about earthquakes and famines, and I'm learning about all of this stuff, and then I go sit down and have my blood pressure checked, right? It's just just so odd, but we can't stand silence. We call silence dead space. Have you ever heard it uh, described uh, that way? So we don't like silence. In fact, this week I saw a study that was done by the University of Virginia And they took a group of people, and one by one, they placed them in a room, and they had them just sit down in a chair, and they weren't allowed to bring in any distractions. No books, no smartphones, no iPads. Uh, The the assignment was go and sit in a room. Now, also in the room, what they placed, the only thing, in fact, was a button. And they told the people when they got into the room that the button, should they go push it, they don't have to, they can just sit there, but should they want to go push it, would deliver to them an extreme electrical shock. So guess what a majority of the people did, including, frankly, mostly the men. (laughs) Sitting alone in a room, the researchers found that men got up and they started to shock themselves. (laughs) See, men, we choose the only form of electronic entertainment available to us (laughs) so that we don't have to be alone with our thoughts, right? Even if it's painful, right? Because we don't like to listen. And that's why we'll choose any kind of distraction because our souls are restless. Why are they restless? Our souls are restless until they rest in the Lord, until we can listen for his small voice. When I think about my life and all the distractions, can I tell you what that distraction is? It's really a search for the divine. It's a search to hear God's voice, and to hear God's voice means that we have to be quiet. We have to listen. Simeon models this for us. Look with me at Luke's description of him, and look at this triple mention of the Holy Spirit's impact upon his life. Let's read it together. The Holy Spirit was upon him and had revealed to him that he would not die until he had seen the Lord's Messiah. That day, the Spirit led him to the temple. You see the triple mention? The Holy Spirit was upon him, had revealed to him, and the Holy Spirit led him. Because Simeon listened, the Holy Spirit could lead. In fact, we learned this week that Simeon's very name means to listen. That's why he can be our teacher, um, because he modeled this. Now, remember how big the temple was. I told you about this a moment ago. And think about what God does through the power of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit leads Simeon into that mass of humanity on the exact day to find the exact young couple carrying the exact right baby. That's amazing, isn't it? That'd be like finding somebody at Edison Mall on Friday. (laughs) And what's amazing is that we think it it might have even been decades earlier that the Holy Spirit had revealed to Simeon that this was going to happen. And on that exact moment, the Holy Spirit leads Simeon into that place. And guess what? The Holy Spirit, the same Holy Spirit is available today to lead and guide Uh, So you can just ask around. You'll find somebody that was led here by the Spirit. Every week, somebody comes here and tells me, and they they, they say something like this. It happened last night at our Saturday night service. Somebody said, "Um, 
well, I came because I was just driving by. And I felt like I just needed to come in here. And I don't really know why, but I'm so glad I did. <laughs> you know what that is, right? That's the Holy Spirit leading somebody. We've heard that story over and over again. We've heard a story that goes like this. Well, a friend of mine was inviting me to Grace Church, and I just felt like I needed to come. And I did it. I'm so glad that I did. What is going on? The Holy Spirit still leads. The Holy Spirit still reveals Jesus to people. Now, what is the best way for the Holy Spirit to lead and guide us? I think it's the same way that Simeon was led in his life. See, we believe that Simeon, he knew God's word in and out. He knew God's word. We, we know this because of the hymn that he sings, a song of praise that he breaks out to later on in the story. And it's a direct quote from the prophet Isaiah. Simeon had been reading the Bible. He knew that this couple was coming from Bethlehem. He knew that Jesus would be born of a virgin. And so he knew this because God's word had spoke to him and he listened. How are you doing with listening to God these days? Can you set aside some time that we like Simeon could open up God's word, ask the Holy Spirit to reveal God's voice through God's word? What if silence was not dead space, but space to come alive? I found my soul comes alive when I can hear the still, small voice of God. Look with me at um, something I was reading this week by Brennan Manning in a book called Souvenirs of Solitude. He said, ask himself this question, do I really believe the good news of Jesus Christ? Do I hear his words spoken to my heart? Shalom, be at peace. I understand your fears, your failures, your brokenness. I don't expect you to be perfect. I have been there. All is well. You have my love. You don't have to pay for it. You can't deserve it. I expect more failure from you than you expect from yourself. You only have to open and receive it. You only have to say yes to my love. A love beyond anything you can intellectualize or imagine. See, God can do more than we could ever ask or imagine. When we listen, when we're led by his spirit, ah, that's the perfect Christmas. Look with me at number three. In the midst of busyness, how can we have a perfect Christmas? Well, by being fully present in the moment is what Simeon models for us. By being fully present in the moment, look with me at the story. Picture in your mind's eye again that mass of people headed to the temple and Mary and Joseph and Jesus are there. And now picture an old man finding them. He's standing on tiptoes, looking through the crowd, and there he spots Mary and Joseph, and look with me at what happens next. It's amazing. Luke 2, 27. So when Mary and Joseph came to present the baby Jesus to the Lord, as the law required, Simeon was there. He took the child into his arms, and he praised God, saying, read it with me, Sovereign Lord, now let your servant die in peace as you have promised. Keep going. I have seen your salvation, which you have prepared for all people. He is a light to reveal God to the nations, and he is the glory of your people, Israel. Now, this took place outside the temple courts. You know what this means is that there was a mass of crowds there, and so many people missed it. See, there's so many people that were busy, and they didn't realize what was happening right there. As this young couple carrying Jesus, standing next to an old man, something amazing took place that we're still talking about 2,000 years later. And people missed it because they were busy, and they weren't looking for that moment when God would act. But Simeon didn't miss it, did he? He didn't miss it at all. Uh, he took the baby Jesus into his arms. I love holding babies, and I'll tell you why. I love the moment that they reach out and they grab onto one of your fingers with their little hand. You know what I'm talking about? Yeah, okay, I'm not alone. I just think that is so cool. There's something that happens in that moment. And imagine with me about Simeon taking Jesus into his arms after waiting for decades, holding on to that hope. What would it have been like to have Jesus' hand wrapped around his pinky? What would it have been like to have that hand, the hand of the Messiah, the hand that would heal so many, including us today, the hand that would break bread at the Lord's Supper, 
the hand that would be outstretched and pierced on a cross for your sin and mine. The resurrected hand that Thomas would touch on that first Easter day. Don't miss the moment. Simeon didn't because he was fully present right then. Let's not miss the moment that God has for us. The moment that God reveals his hand and his heart to each one of us. See, in our busy schedule and all of our demanding, we can miss out that God always lives in the present tense. That has taken a lot of therapy, a lot of prayers from you, a lot of quiet times and Bible readings, a lot of encouragement from folks right here in this room for me to be able to preach the next two minutes because I'm discovering what it's like to live in the present tense. Did you know that Jesus quotes himself in the present tense? He says things like, I am the light of the world. I am the way, the truth, and the life. I am the bread of life. Isn't that amazing? He doesn't say, I used to be, or I'm going to be. Don't you miss it. That's how I used to hear these verses. No, he says, I am. I am. Right here. Right now. So when I was the pastor of a very small church in Kentucky, in the inner city of Lexington, I, there had not been any children in that church for a long time. And we were there, and our son Caleb was in preschool at the time, and some other kids had joined in uh, as I'd become the pastor there. And so we had a little small group of children in our children's ministry, and they decided it would be great to put on a Christmas pageant. And I thought this would be fantastic. And so our children's ministry team got to work, and uh, I got to work too. I was extremely busy uh, during that season, and I was busy even leading up to the pageant. This was going to be a big deal. I was overleading a church of 60 people, and so I was stressed out. And I didn't know what was happening behind the scenes, uh, literally. And that is they went to my son Caleb and they said, we're doing a Christmas pageant. Uh, would you like to be one of the wise men? And Caleb said, no. I will be Caleb. I am Caleb. And they said, well, would you like to be one of the shepherds? He says, no. I am Caleb. I will be Caleb. <laughs> they finally, they, they dole out the big part. You know, the big part is Joseph, right? And so they said, would you like to be Joseph? He says, I'm not Joseph. I am Caleb. So the night came of, for the, the pageant, and I was uh, running around. I was trying to get the sound and the lights and everything, and I was trying to greet everybody. So glad you're here. And everybody uh, was sit seated, and then the children walk in, and I noticed the kids wearing their father's bathrobes, and they had their costumes on, and one of them had the little uh, baby doll from the nursery that they'd taken, put it into a manger. And then I saw Caleb standing next to Joseph wearing blue jeans and his Thomas the Tank Engine T-shirt. <laughs> and as a concerned father, in this big moment, I... I stopped in my tracks and I sat down and I'm so glad that I did because I would have missed it. Because as I watched my son standing confidently in this Christmas pageant, the Holy Spirit spoke to me and I still remember it today. The Holy Spirit said, Wes, would you learn about my son right now from your son? And he said, you can be a part of the Christmas story, Wes. God was whispering to me, you can be a part of the Christmas story just as you are. You don't have to dress up, appear perfect. You don't have to settle for cheap imitations. You can be a part of Christmas right now. In my life in that season, there was a lot of things going wrong. It was so unperfect. And yet, can I tell you, in that moment, it was the perfect Christmas. I want to have a lifetime of those. I want to have a lifetime of those moments, a life like Simeon, where he had one priority, where he could listen to the Holy Spirit, and where he could live every moment. Because in that moment, I realized as I was reaching out for Jesus that he'd been reaching out for me. Let's stand for prayer. <clears throat>
Lord, in this world full of distractions, in this world full of busyness, we quiet our hearts now so that we might hear from you. We thank you that you are speaking to us. Give us ears to hear. In Jesus' name, amen. So the altar is open for you. We're going to worship the Lord. Take a deep breath. The Holy Spirit is here. The same Spirit that led Simeon. Maybe would want to lead you to the altar today. And if you want somebody to pray with you, simply lift a hand. If not, the altar is open. Or the Holy Spirit will meet you right in your seat where you are. I'll be right over here. And if you'd like to say yes to Jesus as your Lord and Savior, I'd love to have the honor of praying with you. Let's worship the Lord together.